so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Hello, everyone. It's Mia here. Over the next three weeks, we'll be dropping the top three no-filter episodes of 2022 into your feed alongside our usual brand new episodes. We are not doing a best of summer. We have got so much goodness to pop into your ears. We loved making all of the episodes that we've made for you in 2022. They've been more than 50 and we hope that you've enjoyed listening to them. The best way to support us if you have enjoyed listening to all of those episodes is to become a Mamma Mia subscriber. If you already are, thank you so much. We will put a link in the show notes and we cannot wait to tell more stories in 2023. It was the 12th of September, 2018, and Australian academic Kylie Moore Gilbert was making her way through Tehran's international airport in Iran. She'd been in Iran for three weeks for a work trip. She was a lecturer at Melbourne University, specialising in Islamic studies, and Kylie had been invited to the country by another university. All in all, she'd had a really great time there. But now she was on her way home, and if she was being honest, she was slightly relieved because for the past 24 hours, Kylie couldn't help but feel like she was being watched and she couldn't wait to get home to her husband and her parents and shake this feeling. She reached into a bag, pulled her passport out and she was getting ready to check in at the airport after texting her parents to say, I'll be home soon, when she felt a tap on the shoulder. What happened next? Well, that's for Kylie to tell you. But it would be 804 days until she'd ever see her passport again. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, a podcast where people like Kylie tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. My name is Mia Friedman. After being detained and then arrested at the airport, Kylie Moore Gilbert spent 804 days incarcerated in Tehran's Evin and Kwachak prisons for espionage, a crime she never committed. During those two and a half years that she spent in prison, most of it in solitary confinement, from the ages of 31 to almost 34, Kylie had no bed, no mattress, no pillow, no tampons, and for some of it, no lights and no windows and no toilets. Kylie was completely cut off from the outside world. She was an innocent Australian stuck in a harsh foreign prison with no way of getting home. And she joins me now for a very special episode of No Filter. Kylie, tell me a little bit about what your life was like before September 2018 when you went to Iran. I think I was living a pretty regular life, really. I am originally from New South Wales. I would spent several years living overseas, mainly in the UK, but I'd moved back to Australia and moved to Melbourne. I did my PhD at Melbourne Uni and I was at that time working then as a lecturer at Melbourne Uni, uh, lecturing in Middle East history and politics. I had recently bought a house in the far-flung uh, Dandenong Ranges, so quite a commute from Melbourne, but um, you know, as a young person trying to get my foot on the housing ladder, that was the best I could do. Uh, I'd recently got married, so I was in my early 30s and I guess living a pretty regular life, you know, starting off my career, starting, you know, a, a relationship, buying a house. So I was in that kind of that place and uh, I thought I was going to Iran for three weeks and that my life would continue in that vein afterwards. Iran's not somewhere that most people would visit, certainly not for a holiday, but you were going for work. What were you doing there? So I'd been invited to go to Iran, actually, by an Iranian university and they were running a program uh, for scholars in my field to learn more about uh, Shia Islam in Iran. And, and it's the majority religion of Iran, but it's actually a minority sect within Islam more broadly. So um, I guess it was a, a soft cultural outreach uh, program being run by an Iranian university to try to uh, link themselves more strongly to foreign uh, universities and build research contacts, that kind of thing. 
And I just thought it would be really interesting. I've always wanted to visit Iran and my research wasn't on Iran at all. It wasn't on Shia Islam at all, but I had touched on Shia Islam in other research projects I'd done. So it was sort of relevant to me. And yeah, I just thought, why not? Like if, if someone invites you to go to an interesting and exotic foreign location for work and the university approved my trip and, and, and paid for the flights and everything. So why not? Like I, I thought it would be a, a good professional opportunity. The day you were due to fly home, you were arrested at the airport. What are your memories of that day? I remember the arrest itself quite well, although the day in the lead up to the arrest, I was quite anxious. And I think I was I, I, I cottoned on, as you know from the book, I knew that something was wrong before I was arrested. I just never in a million years thought that I'd be on a, on a flight uh, list, banned from, from leaving the country. And I, you know, some men had come to my hotel the day before and asked about me, asked what my room number was, this kind of thing to the receptionist. And he actually told me, he gave me a heads up about it. So I was already nervous from that. And I thought, okay, it's good I'm leaving the country. I don't know who these men are or what they want, but I'm, I'm flying out anyway. So as long as I avoid them until then, it's it'll be okay. So I was a little bit highly strung. I didn't really sleep very much that night, the night before my flight. And, um, you know, I, nobody came up to me during the day or anything. The men didn't come back to the hotel while I was there. And I, I went to the airport with all my stuff, checked my baggage in and uh, was walking to immigration with my passport ready to be stamped when um, people who I later learned were the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, IRGC, uh, approached me and tapped me on the shoulder and took me away to an interrogation room inside the airport and told me I wouldn't be making my flight. Uh, so my memory in the lead up was just sort of one of anxiety and being ready to leave the country, saying, OK, something here is not right. Um, it's good that I'm leaving today. But the actual moment of the arrest itself is quite sharp in my memory. And, um, you know, I was interrogated for several hours in that airport room um, before being moved elsewhere. And yeah, I remember it quite vividly. Where were you taken from the airport? I was first taken to a kind of a safe house, uh, an apartment um, clearly controlled or owned by the IRGC in uh, northern Tehran. Uh, it was clearly used for filming purposes. It was the, the living room of the apartment was set up like a film studio and I wasn't filmed there, so I'm not sure why, but um, Actually, I was allowed to take a nap for an hour amidst all the film paraphernalia, so I got to see it up close. So they were clearly using it, I guess, to film prisoners or false confessions or something like that. It was clearly used for interrogations and other security-related purposes. And I was interrogated there overnight without, you know, with with one hour's sleep at dawn. And um, after that interrogation... I was, you know, almost passed out from fatigue by that point and I was taken to a hotel um, also under their control in Tehran and I was there for one week interrogated on a daily basis by, by the same group of people. What were they asking you, Kylie? Like what, what was their accusation? I think they, were, they weren't clear at that point what they were wanting to accuse me of. They were interested in recruiting me as some sort of informer or spy to work for them because they asked me about it within the first 24 hours. They kind of informally sounded me out, which was bizarre to me because I had no idea who they were or what was going on. So I kind of didn't take it seriously at that point. They had decided I was suspicious and they were just digging to try to figure out why and what they could get on me. So they asked me about absolutely everything. Um... Really, it was when they got into all of my email accounts and I initially had given them fake passwords or, or hadn't told them about my primary email address, but in the end they got all of it out and I gave them the passwords um, because I didn't really have a choice at that point. And um, when they went through my emails, they found messages from people, they found topics or subjects or information that then they were able to expand upon in the interrogation and it kind of snowballed from there. But you know, they initially wanted to know about my research, what I was doing in Iran, the research trip I'd taken to Bahrain for my PhD a few years earlier, um, visits to Israel that I'd made, um, my my ex-husband and, and his links to Israel, um, 
even everything, even including my family history and what my great grandparents were doing and stuff like that, which I didn't know very much about at all. They were really digging around everywhere they could at that point. When you were in the hotel and previously in the safe house and even even when you were being interrogated at the airport, what did you think was going to happen? I had no conception whatsoever that I would be sent to prison. I just, if like, I would not have believed it if had they told me. I, because I'd done nothing wrong, I thought, okay, this is a misunderstanding. I will explain to them that I've done nothing wrong. I'll show them that I'm innocent. They'll interrogate me and then they'll let me go and, and get back on the plane and fly back to Australia. So I cooperated them at the beginning. I tried to answer their questions because I thought, well, I've got nothing to hide. I haven't done anything. So, you know, that when they're finished with me, when they've asked me all the questions they have to ask, they're just going to let me go home. I And they, they were lying to me and telling me that as well. So especially in the hotel, they led me to believe that once I'd cooperated and, and done everything they needed me to do, then they would actually themselves buy me a ticket and put me on a plane. So uh, I was naive and at the beginning that's what I thought would happen. It was just you alone in a room with up to a dozen men. Were you worried for your safety? Did they hurt you? Were you worried that you would be sexually assaulted? Yes, I was. This was one of my first fears. One of the first times that I felt physically unsafe was when there was a large scrum of men around me and I because I didn't know who they were they wouldn't tell me who they were they weren't wearing uniforms they were all plain clothes I didn't speak Farsi they were all quite aggressive and hostile in the the way they were speaking with one another um and there was somebody who was an appointed translator but he a didn't speak fluent English but b didn't translate anything other than a direct request of me into English so I was just bewildered by what was going on and there were so many men and they were quite hostile and aggressive and I, I I was actually you know when they put me in the hotel I didn't really sleep for the first night because I was afraid that one of them would come in and do something to me or they would come back in the middle of the night or they were, I later learned actually there were cameras everywhere in that hotel in my bedroom there were hidden cameras so they would have been watching me get undressed this kind of thing. I hope there weren't cameras in the showers, but I I wouldn't know. So, you know, I definitely had that fear. You know, these are highly, highly religious men that see Western women uncovered. I mean, I I was wearing a hijab, but not at at all of the the level of hijab that they would advocate. They, you know, they would have seen me as fair game maybe. And and I was being in, in the middle, you know, being a scholar of the Middle East, I have encountered these kinds of people before, and I know that often they are quite... They can be. They, they see Western women as objects of harassment sometimes, um, and I, I did feel quite afraid that they would um, assault me. You were taken to Evan Prison and put into solitary confinement. What was it like physically when you were taken there? And and did you know that's where you were going? No, um, I had no idea a that I was going to prison and b that I'd be put in solitary. Uh, I actually um. When they put me in the solitary cell, they'd given me the prison uniform to change into and I just thought this was like a change room for the uniform. It was so small, I couldn't, it didn't even cross my mind I would have to sleep in there. I literally thought she just put me in the room, closed the door, I'm going to get changed and then she's going to take me to the to the real cell. <laughs> it was tiny. It had no window, no natural light. There was just a light on 24 hours a day in the, in the ceiling, a very bright LED sort of thing no furniture, no stimulation whatsoever, designed to torment you, designed to break you for the interrogation. So complete sort of sensory deprivation. You you could, there was nothing to do whatsoever. The only object in the room was a telephone for calling the guards, but because I couldn't speak Farsi and they couldn't speak English, if I called them, nothing would happen because I'm saying I need to go to the toilet and they didn't understand what that meant and so they would just hang up on me and so I I was just in this horrible box unable to communicate with anyone and not really understanding what was going on. How did you go to the toilet? Uh, Initially I would bang on the door and they didn't like that they didn't like any making of noise so they would come and open the door and I would be sort of toilet toilet and, and they understood that and they would take me to the bathroom Uh, only when they had time or when they felt like it. So I would be blindfolded as well when I was taken to the bathroom so that I wouldn't see the hallways or the the other rooms in the facility. 
Um, but that didn't, you know, after a while I had seen everything. Um, but for that first month, I was very heavily blindfolded and escorted by the arm to the toilet and given one square of toilet paper. And if I spent more than sort of 30 seconds in there, they'd bang on the door and yell at me. And, you know, it, going to the toilet was a fraught experience in and of itself. What about getting your period? Oh, my God, Mia, this was a nightmare. Kylie, I'm just like I know these are such like basic questions, but of course that's it's like your basic dignity was taken away. How did you cope with these very basic needs that you would have had? Honestly, every female prisoner in there, you can have an hours long discussion about these things with them. I've heard countless horror stories like principally Iran doesn't believe in tampons. It's very difficult to get tampons in Iran because they believe that it takes a woman's virginity. There's all these superstitions about tampons. So the prison guards basically banned tampons because they said only an immoral woman would use such a thing. And it's actually a very pervasive idea. Even, you know, with other prisoners, I discussed it. And many of them, especially older ones or ones who hadn't travelled abroad, believed that, you know, you no man would want to marry you if you were a single woman, if you'd used tampons for your period. So they, they used these terrible, huge fat nappy pads that looked like they belonged, you know, like incontinence pads for elderly people. This was all we were given for our periods. And, and actually, I had many fights over it because they would give me one at a time. You know, they wouldn't give me a packet. They'd come and dole out one every time I, I – and even communicating that that's what I needed when I didn't speak fast, yeah. you know, was very difficult. Yeah. So it was a it, – and it was a very unhygienic place. The toilets were very, very dirty. There was no toilet paper to clean yourself. I wasn't allowed to shower at the beginning except once every three days. So cleaning yourself, it was – yeah, it was a nightmare. I mean, I'm not going to go into the gritty details, but – um, it just th- – these feminine hygiene issues were huge until it got marginally better when I was allowed to make certain grocery purchases once a month on a shopping list. Maybe after six months or so or seven months of my incarceration, the embassy dropped some cash off at the prison and I was able to make a shopping list that someone would go and purchase and deliver to the prison, one of the IRGC guys, not the embassy – And I put on pads, like a Western brand of pads, and a few times that got delivered to me and that that was much better. But, yeah, we were banned from any cleaning products. So even with that that money, we weren't able to buy bleach or or bathroom spray or disinfectant because they said, oh, if you buy that, you'll drink it and kill yourself. And so, and I used to fight them and say, well, you come and put it in there. You you spray it around and then take it away and I won't touch it, but just spray it so I can clean the toilet or whatever. And, um, but, you know, it was, it, it, they refused. So this was really difficult, was dealing with the sanitary situation, um, especially yeah, when you had your period. When you were in solitary confinement and there were just four walls, what did you literally do every day? So a lot of the days I was taken to interrogation and I actually wanted to go because even though that was obviously very unpleasant um, and a very hostile atmosphere normally and I felt constantly under siege and under attack there in that interrogation room, it was still better than being left alone inside my own head for hours and hours in that room, in that solid confinement cell. And toward the end of my interrogations, they came less and less frequently And every weekend there'd be two or three days where I would be just on my own. And you wouldn't know when they're coming. So you'd be anticipating that the interrogators might come for you every day. And some days they did, some days they didn't. So when I was left on my own for those days on end where where I didn't go anywhere, it it was basically like psychological torture. You know, I, I was the first week was the worst until I developed psychological coping mechanisms. But I was bouncing off the walls. My brain was thinking at a million miles an hour over all sorts of subjects, wracked by guilt, wracked by regret. I should have done this differently. I should have done that differently. Fear about the future, anxiety, worry. It was all rolling through my brain at an intense speed. And, you know, I would try and play games with myself. I would try and memorise or recite things that I thought I could memorise, try to remember the lyrics of songs, try to remember my times tables but you know it was, it, it was really really hard and a lot of my memories sort of blanked out for like some of that period I think from the 
the trauma of it all because le- being left alone inside your own head with zero stimulation whatsoever and no natural light, no no control. I didn't even have control over my own toothbrush. I didn't even have control over whether I could take a shower or go to the toilet. I had control over nothing whatsoever. It, it It's designed to break you and it really is very effective. It really, really does make you suffer so much. You mentioned psychological coping mechanisms that you developed. What were they? Somehow my brain managed to slow itself down, um, not for the first couple of weeks, but over time, slowly, after about the two-week mark, I kind of started to inhabit this like semi-asleep, semi-awake state. Not really meditation, but it wasn't a, a deliberate thing I was trying to do. Like I'm very bad at meditation, but a few times I tried to meditate um, and, I, you know, I just couldn't turn off my brain. But after about two weeks, I, I would lie down on my um, on the floor because there were no beds or mattresses with the kind of an itchy blanket over my head to block out the light. And I wasn't tired enough to sleep, but I would just close my eyes and my, my memories would become very vivid and especially my long-term memories. So my short-term memory, completely gone. Um, all prisoners say this, that solitary confinement kind of after a while induces a sort of amnesia or Alzheimer's in your short-term memory. You know, if you had have asked me what's what's on my Spotify playlist, I wouldn't have been able to tell you, you know, or what movies did I see before I went to Iran. Um, but I could suddenly, like, draw on these ultra-vivid memories of my childhood, of events that I'd long forgotten or thought I'd forgotten in my brain and then kind of relive them and go through them and inhabit that strange space of kind of half asleep, half awake, half in my memories, trying to forget the present, forget the future and just sort of live in the past. And I don't really know what that's called or whether that's a thing or it just happened to me, but that's kind of how I, in a way, coped. I just slowed my brain down and and lived in the past. There were almost two parallel tracks. You were living your hell in an Iranian jail and your family, your husband, your parents were like, what, what did they think were going on? What were they doing? At the beginning, they had very little information. The government didn't really tell them much. I don't think the government really knew what was going on either. I was able to contact them on a kind of an ad hoc basis by a WhatsApp from the interrogations. So, you know, when I got arrested the first time at the airport, that night they let me text my family on WhatsApp and say, you know, they made me write some silly excuse like, I've decided to extend my trip in Iran to do more research or something when I'd already told them I checked in for my flight and I was at the airport. So there's no way they would have believed that. But I guess to show them that I'm okay and I'm alive and some horrible accident hasn't happened. So periodically they were allowing me to, I guess, show proof of life or or message my parents or whatever and tell them that I'm still around. I wasn't allowed to say I was in prison but I'm sure they would have worked that out at some point. And I'm, I imagine the government would have worked it out too and perhaps had have, have told them, I'm not sure. But everybody knew very little. I was allowed to say very little and my contact with them was just haphazard and at, at, to the whims of the interrogators essentially. You were held at Evan in the notorious 2A unit for 23 months, almost two years. How did your mental state change over that time? I feel like I actually became stronger as time went on. I think you have to first perceive the parameters of your surroundings, where you are, why you're there, who's captured you, what's going on, what possibly could happen to you, for example, going to court and getting sentenced to prison, something like that, Um, whether there could be a diplomatic deal on the offering, this kind of thing. Once I perceived the boundaries of what's possible and what's not possible, where I am and why and who captured me, I think I started to understand the rules of the game a little bit better and I drew strength from that. I also educated myself through making contact with other prisoners. Can you talk a little bit about how you made contact with, with other prisoners? So they reached out to me. They heard I was there. They heard my voice speaking English to the guards and the guards not understanding me and speaking back in Persian. I'd scratched some stuff in English on the wall of the outdoor exercise area and they occasionally scratched a response, a word or two back to me. And then 
I received in the outdoor exercise area some a small bag of food of nuts and fruits and a small letter uh, written on some toilet paper with a piece of chocolate that they'd scratched onto the toilet paper. And um, these were two girls in a cell just opposite mine, actually, but they were two in a cell, not one like me. And then I made contact with their friends in a different cell down the hall. There were three of them at the time. So, and they all spoke English. And because I didn't speak fast, they were able to tell me in English what who these people were, what the rules were, what they could do to me and what they wouldn't do to me, that I should have hope that my government will get me out because often the Iranians take people hostage to make deals and to get something in exchange, that I shouldn't make a false confession, that I should stay true and, and just tell the truth and, you know, not not trust them because they weren't trustworthy. They would they would play me in the end if I trusted them. So I got to understand a lot from these friends and they really risked themselves to reach out to me. It was really dangerous for them. They didn't have to do that. They were really good people that wanted to help me. They could hear that I was in distress. They could hear I didn't understand the language and and some of them really became my friends and my sisters. You went to incredible lengths to communicate with each other. Can you describe some of the ways that you would do that? We had a, an air conditioning vent at, for a period of several months that through this convoluted system of vents that we figured out um, one of the vents, we had maybe four vents in each cell, uh, one in the toilet and, or three maybe, and um, we figured out one of our vents connected to the one of their vents. So, in, and I had to sort of climb the toilet cistern in order to get my head up there and, and talk through the vent. But at certain times on certain guard shifts, we figured out we could communicate through these vents without it being discovered. So every three nights on certain guard shifts, we would talk for maybe 10 minutes, um, myself and my friend Nilufar and Horda, who were in a, a cell next to mine. And this is when, you know, we, we exchanged notes too, but this was where we could, you know, exchange the most information. Uh, we were moved cells many times and that vent situation didn't last, but um, we, desi- we devised several different ways of passing notes and the, the most successful way which I actually came up with was we got a pair of pants, uh, prison uniform pants that were spare, you know, because prisoners would come in and then go out and you wash your clothes and you put them on a rack in the, the communal laundry. So when we discovered there was a spare pair of pants on the rack, I stole them, um, pretending they were mine, and managed to open the seam um, of the, the bottom of the trouser, um, maybe one or half a centimetre and roll up a very small note in a long tube and insert it into that seam. And then um, we've marked the pants with a small asterisk actually on the the waistband to know that these were the note pants. And um, I would wash them alongside my own uniform, trying to keep the note as dry as possible and hang them up on the rack in a certain part of the rack as an indication that those pants were a delivery of a note. And then the other cell would take them, pretending that's their washing that they're taking from the rack and remove it back to their cell and take the note out and read it. And um, it was a very complex operation to write the notes in in secret away from the camera as well and get them into the pants. But it was actually never discovered. Unlike several other methods we had, we were never caught with that one. Um, And we kept it up for months and months. Some of the things that were considered contraband were pen and paper. I mean, that was considered an absolute luxury but occasionally you got hold of some didn't you like how what did you write these notes with so we all had secret pens for a time um one of my friends elena was a master at stealing pens um she even stole a pen from the judge and it had his name on the side and it became like a trophy for us like how on earth when you're in court you go you're put on trial you managed to steal a pen from the judge um and so you know she would nick them from it from various judiciary meetings from the interrogation one time even find them from the if the guards had ever left a pen lying around in their area she would always cause a distraction and manage to, to steal it so often the pens would be discovered and confiscated from us but um there was sort of an a network of secret pens going around. Um, I tricked the guards just by luck into a pen I had been given to answer some interrogation questions with. I managed to fool the guards into thinking I'd given back when I hadn't. So I would keep that pen in a number of locations, initially in my underwear and then inside a a pipe um, 
that was linked to the toilet plumbing in my cell and um, would write the notes to my friends on the toilet squatting down where it was a black spot from the camera and we would write on scraps of um, packaging, scraps of cardboard, you know, the, the cardboard of a toilet paper roll or um, even toilet paper itself if we, we didn't have anything else. So we became quite good at stealing and, and hiding pens and even if you took the actual thin vessel of the ink out of the plastic pen itself, then it became really, really small and thin and that that could be inserted into the, the hem of a piece of clothing, article of clothing, and not be dis- discovered as well. So it was harder to write with because it was bendy, but you could do that. I've, I did that a few times too to avoid detection. I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter with Kylie Moore-Gilbert. You mentioned that you were moved from cell to cell quite a lot. So after that initial period of of more than a month in that tiny two by two windowless um, cell, but it was interesting to read that every time you were moved, for someone who's not experienced it, I would have thought, oh, you would have been excited for a change of scene, but you always felt very, very anxious when you were moved. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I I think because psychologically you become dependent on that space very quickly, it becomes a comfort almost. You, the routine of prison is comforting to you. Anything outside of the routine is scary. You get into that psychological space where by the end of my four weeks in that extreme solitary confinement box, I had figured out how to manage my brain and any anything outside the routine just terrified me. So when I was removed from that cell and brought into a slightly larger one with a TV, um, TV locked on one channel at one high volume and couldn't turn it off and didn't understand the language. So it, it actually was worse to have that TV than without. But um, I guess it was a step up. You know, it was some sort of reward in a way. Um, I don't know. But I just freaked out. I didn't want to go there. I actually got myself transferred back to my old solitary cell for one night before agreeing to move. And it was the suddenness and the unexpectedness of it too. They just rocked up one day and said, pack your stuff or pack you up, pack up your blankets. We're moving in there. And um, I just, yeah, I, I couldn't deal with it psychologically because you become really dependent on that space and on routine. You just slept on the floor. Like a, was it just a, a hard floor with a with a scratchy blanket, like no pillow, no mattress. Yep, there was. I didn't sleep on a mattress for the entire two years and three months in Iran. Oh. Um, I didn't have a pillow. What did I, that do to your back, Kylie? Like, oh, were you in agony? My back was okay, but my neck, because of the lack of a pillow, mm. I put like a, a. I folded up a blanket and put it under my head, but it was itchy, bulky, hard. It felt like I had a brick under my head, you know. It really, my, I had a lot of neck pain and neck problems. Um, other prisoners, though, I saw plenty of older women in their 60s, for example, who already had bad backs before they came in or who were overweight or had various health problems and just sleeping on the floor like that was agony for them um, and they really couldn't do it. They were constantly whimpering and, and in pain and, and suffering from it and it's part of the suffering, you know. They, they treat you like an animal and it's deliberate they dehumanize you and not giving you a a proper bed or a pillow or a sheet or a mattress is part of that having everything be dirty and unclean is part of that you know I was constantly one of my pastimes was to pick other people's hairs out of my blankets and I would spend hours meticulously going over every inch of my three blankets and pulling black curly hairs and people's head hair and everything out and creating a big ball of them on the floor you know and so I think it was deliberate they they didn't give us clean blankets they didn't give us bedding because they wanted us to suffer and and all of these small humiliations um all of them worked together to break us same with not being able to shower there was no logical reason why at the beginning I could only shower every three days very quickly because I just couldn't deal with it and was having meltdowns over it in the end they let me shower every day but um, there was no logical reason for it. It was just to make you suffer, dehumanise you. Mm. Were there little things that you did that were like privately defiant to sort of maintain your dignity? The first real act of defiance I undertook was a hunger strike. 
well, I guess you could say it was contacting my friends in other cells and, and stealing a pen and hiding it and everything. That was obviously defiant too. Uh, but I took the step of going on hunger strike after about four months of my incarceration and actually it worked and I, and I had my demands fulfilled um, and I underwent maybe seven hunger strikes, I think, um, over the time of my incarceration. And that actually felt good because you felt like you were actually doing something. It was one of the only things you could control was whether you ate or not. They couldn't really force you to eat unless they took you to hospital and force fed you, but they never did that to me. So uh, I felt some measure of control that I was clawing back some control and I could make demands and I had some agency and power in doing that. So I think that was really the first proper step of, of outward, obvious, overt defiance that I took. But, I, you know, I'd resisted a lot. I, I After I knew that I was going to court and they would convict me and give me a prison sentence, because it was obvious, it was just a kangaroo court, it was totally corrupt and a total sham, um, and that was clear to me from the beginning, and I'd heard stories of others as well by that point. Um, I just realised, well, cooperating with them hasn't served me well at all, and I haven't gained anything by being nice and quiet and, and placating them. Um, so I may as well at least claw back some of my dignity and resist. And I did. And and sometimes I shot myself in the foot and other times I did win concessions for myself. So, But it, it gave me a feeling like I was doing something at least. I wasn't just this passive person sitting back and waiting for others to rescue me. So it, it did actually play a, a big role in my ability to survive psychologically, I think. The, the idea that I was resisting and I was showing defiance and I was actually trying to influence my own fate. What does a hunger strike feel like? The beginning is the hardest. That might be a little bit counterintuitive, but I found the first two days the hardest. You do have really strong pangs of hunger. If I was doing it with other prisoners in my cell who weren't striking and were eating, especially the hot food, you know, it, it was disgusting, but they'd deliver like a stew or something with rice for lunch, for example. And if the prisoners, you know, opened that, all the smell would waft throughout the room. And, you know, I would often be lying prostrate because I didn't have much energy and you'd lose blood pressure very quickly and I'd be very lightheaded. Um, but I'd just smell it. And it was almost like the smell was more intense because I was deprived of, of food myself. And it was quite torturous for me to smell that, you know, that disgusting stew that the other prisoners were getting. But then after a few days, you kind of get used to not eating um, if you keep hydrating, you, you're generally okay for four, five, six days. Okay by – I always had low blood pressure even before I went to Iran. So my blood pressure would just plummet and I couldn't move. Even sitting up, I would just see stars and my head would swim and I would it would take me a really long time to walk to the toilet, for example. I'd walk like an elderly person, hand on the wall to stop myself falling. Everything's very bright, seeing stars. Um, it would be a real mission to get out of bed and, and move anywhere after a few days. And um, I did a, a dry strike once where I didn't, I refused water as well. And that was the toughest because after, I think I lasted two days after even one day of not drinking or eating. The headaches that you got from dehydration and it, everything was was really painful. Um, it, everything was on fire. It, it, your body just was crying out for water in particular. I lasted 48 hours without water and then I was hospitalised and put on a drip. So they put the, you know, intravenous, put, um, you know, water back in, hydrated me. So I, um, that was the hardest by far. I, I, the longest I'd lasted on a wet hunger strike was about eight or nine days, I think. But by then, I mean, I was always hospitalised and then they'd just drip, drip feed vitamins and things into me and, and I would perk up again. But, um, you know, it, it is really tough, but the first few days are the hardest, for sure. When you, your body still, I guess, has some food in its digestive tract so it's still digesting and working and doing something so it's calling out for more and you have those real pangs of hunger then when everything empties out and you're just drinking water um i think it's sort of the, the pangs and the, the pains lessen in a way and you get used to it in a way all through this time from the from the minute that you were um detained at the airport you were being interrogated and the lead interrogator was uh, an Iranian Revolutionary Guard called Kazi. 
your relationship with him or his relationship with you was so twisted and brutal and intense and complicated. Can you explain how how it was and how it developed over those years that you were held? Yeah, this is really hard for me to sort of articulate because I don't properly even understand it myself. Um, he was sort of more senior than the interrogators in a way. He was the the head or res- responsible for judicial affairs or legal affairs within um, the Revolutionary Guards Intelligence Wing, intelligence organisation. And he was actually one of the main interlocutors of the Australian government in negotiating my release. Uh, so he was quite senior and um, I think was linked through family ties to the head of the IRGC's intelligence unit, um, which gave him, because it's all very incestuous and ma- mafia-like in a way, it's all one big family and it gave him the ability to act outside the rules of his own organisation in a way. Um, he broke the rules many times, he kind of did what he wanted um, and acted with impunity. So even, you know, from the first few nights in the hotel, he was telling me things and doing things which were outside of the rules. Um, and he was there on the night of my arrest. Uh, he initially played the good cop role in the hotel, for example, um, and sort of, I think, wanted to recruit me. He was he was trying to recruit me for most of the time I was there, using either carrots or... To be a spy yeah. for Iran. Yes, even though they were accusing you of being a spy and they convicted you of being a spy for Israel? Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I think he and, and they knew I wasn't a spy, but once their organisation decided that would be the line they were running and that's what they were going to convict me of, they all just sort of parroted the, the propaganda from then on. But, um, yeah, so he, it sort of, we had a very, um, like, conflicted relationship there's a lot of animosity between us. He had a sort of a classic male ego. Um, he wanted to call the shots, be in charge and wanted everybody. I think he was used to getting his way with everything, including among his colleagues. Um, maybe some something about my defiance attracted him in a way. I don't know. I um, I would often make, make jokes and, and mock him, laugh at him. And I think in a way he liked that because nobody else really had the balls to do it to him and I didn't really understand who he was or how important he was and I didn't really care at that point either so that's probably why I I was doing it. So he went through phases of being really, really horrible, um, using uh, sticks instead of carrots and, you know, banning me. I was banned from family calls, embassy, consular visits, um, everything banned from everything you know, as a result of one of my acts of defiance and that was him that instigated that ban he went to the judge and, and got me banned from you know contacting my family for nine months and um, banning me from embassy, embassy visits is against international law but they still managed to do that so you know he was responsible for a lot of my suffering um, you know in two a uh, but then toward the beginning of 2020 when the situation changed with the negotiations with the Australian government and they gave up on trying to recruit me, um, he kind of changed his behaviour toward me and started actually uh, flirting with me, courting me, breaking the rules in order to give me favour, to show off, to give me benefits and and presents. He he organised a birthday party for me. He bought me clothes. He bought me cake. He bought me pizza. He, you know... um, developed feelings for me essentially and I um I guess I don't know if I had a choice but I entered into this dangerous risky sort of game of trying to toy with his affections and use his in a way weakness for me to my benefit but without properly understanding the rules of the game and the parameters and and therefore shooting myself in the foot a hell of a lot of the time because I just couldn't I couldn't play the game where I, when I didn't have any cards in my hand and I didn't know the rules of the game. So it was a really yeah, – and, and he – there was a lot of emotional abuse. I was, in, I was entirely under his power. I was in solitary confinement under his control and it was, yeah, it was a really, really difficult situation I couldn't get out of that I was trying to influence to my benefit. The word I kept coming back to as I read your account was feisty – and I kept saying while I was reading, Kylie, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I was so 
worried for you. And I was just like, don't say that. Don't do that. Don't mock him. Just be a good girl, which I thought was interesting. Like I was like, just play the game to get out of there. But of course, what would I know? Um, But also I realized that you never gave up. Like you never were, I mean, there were times when you were, had complete despair, but it didn't last long. And, and I was wondering if that sense of pushing back and, and being feisty, that was part of how you survived. Was it a choice? It was. I think that's a really good way of looking at it, actually, because I don't know if I'm a feisty person in, in real life, but I'm actually, I'm, I am stubborn and I do have a kind of a sense of justice, I guess, or injustice or, you know, I, I don't like when I, I'm not somebody who's, who it's easy to bully. So um, I, for me, I had had enough. I was completely fed up with towing the line and doing what they wanted when they constantly broke their promises, shifted the goalposts and essentially fucked me over. Like They were bullies and I was weak. And they were getting what they wanted from my weakness. I had to stand up to them and show them that I was stronger than they thought in order to, I guess, establish a red line um, and not let them do whatever they wanted to me. So I saw it as it was a survival mechanism in a way for me. I didn't know how long I would be there for. I wanted to come out with my dignity intact as well. And it was important to me to stand up to them. And, yes, I, you know, I I did have a big mouth at times and... um, you know, would mock and belittle certain members of them that I knew I would get away with or um, joke around with Kazi Zade or whatever. But that was because I understood I probably would get away with it. You know, like I I spoke enough Farsi by that point. I understood the dynamic between them all by that point. And I just didn't care. Like you just reach a point where you stop caring. You're like, I've got nothing to lose, you know. And um, befriending some of them actually was beneficial because I got information out of them. So I... I probably wasn't very smart. I probably should have just kept my head down, stayed quiet and not um, got to know any of them and um, just waited for the government to get me out. But I wasn't seeing any movement on that front. And because it wasn't in the media for so long, I just I didn't trust that I would be prioritised, that anybody really knew what was going on. And um, so I just thought that was really the only avenue I had left to me. Because he was so instrumental in the negotiations with the Australian government about your release, did it occur to you that maybe he was going to stall them so that he could keep you there because he'd become so obsessed with you? Yeah, um, it occurred to me too late, you know, once I was already too deep in it to get out. Uh, And I actually didn't think that this person is powerful enough to do that, to, to get in the way of a diplomatic negotiation. I'm pretty sure that's what happened, but I don't know, 100%. Um, but they would have got me out in the end, but I do believe that I spent a significant period extra in prison because of his infatuation with me and the fact that he didn't really want to make a deal to let me go and so kept putting roadblocks in the way for the hell of it. Has he tried to contact you since you got out? He hasn't contacted me directly, no. I mean, that would be... uh, He was, I believe, removed from my case because of this relationship with me, for want of a better word, about a a couple of months before my release. He was still influencing things, though, from behind the scenes, I believe up until five weeks or four weeks before my release, um, when he did manage to send me a few messages via other people when I was moved back to 2A... Um, in October or September uh, 2020. And to be clear, the feelings were never requited. <laughs> it was not, it was very much a one-way abusive relationship. Yeah, definitely. But I ga- def- certainly uh, gave him to believe that there was hope, you know, because I, I was trying to leverage him um, to for my freedom, but also for better conditions in prison. You know, I was, it was for me a matter of survival. I wanted him on side. I wanted him to be my friend because he was so powerful in there that he he could do things like bring me a three-tiered chocolate cake with my name iced on it for my birthday or, you know, authorise me to be able to wear my own clothes and not the prison uniform, authorise me to have extra shopping lists, authorise me to even go outside the prison for medical treatment. You know, he, he allowed me to go to an optometrist in Tehran 
um, and choose a pair of glasses because I, my eyesight was ruined by years of staring at a wall a couple of metres in front of me. Um, so I needed reading glasses and, and he authorised that, you know, medical treatment, all sorts of things. I, I, it was beneficial to me to sort of develop a friendly relationship with him in order to leverage that. So whilst um, it wasn't reciprocated, it, I, I, I did, you know, encourage it to a certain extent at certain times because I could see the benefits. Sometimes another thing that he had control over was when you were occasionally given your phone during interrogations and allowed to either WhatsApp or call your family. Um, and in that early f- stage, your husband, Roslan, when did the phone calls with your now ex-husband start to become a little odd and start to give you, you know, cause for confusion? After the second call I had to him ever actually, um, the first call was just out of the blue. He wasn't expecting it. He didn't know where I was. He was very worried about me and he was himself just a just worried husband wanting information about his wife. But the second time I called, he was distant, he was cold. I had a feeling he wasn't the only person in the room and he had developed a, a kind of a security mindset. And, I mean, as he would, I mean, I, you know, he knew that some nefarious group in Iran had arrested me or or taken me hostage or something so of course he would be mindful of security but I just felt like it wasn't the person I knew that I was talking to it was someone else and it was cold and unfeeling and I just it it, it upset me. Did you eventually sort of stop speaking and stop contacting each other? Well we couldn't you know especially because of his links to Israel once um, the first phase was out of the way and they'd got what they wanted or tried out of him um I was not allowed to call him really um, because his other occasionally would give me a favour and allow me to call him. But I was mainly calling my parents and my sister Belinda um, on the rare occasion that I was permitted phone calls. You had a lot of time to think. Did you tell yourself a story about what might have happened? I certainly theorised a lot about how I came to have been arrested in the first place I just because I didn't understand all the dynamics and I still don't completely you know, from getting to know some of the IRGC, including Kazi Zadeh and others, I did. I was able to piece a few things together about over time, over a number of years, about how I came to have, you know, been flagged on their radar at all. And a guy that I'd interviewed um, prior to my arrest in Iran, who wasn't an Iranian, he was a Bahraini, uh, for my research, had some sort of involvement with the Revolutionary Guards and had essentially betrayed me, dogged me in his for whatever reason, as someone suspicious to them, which what led to them taking an interest in me whilst I was still in Iran for my academic three-week trip and um, led to my arrest. So this person um, essentially is responsible for my arrest. At one stage, Kazi said to you, your husband's having an affair, your marriage is over. Did you just think that was just another thing that he was saying to you to try and break you? Yeah, I didn't really give it much credence at the time because... Yeah, as, as you said, like they would say things to me like that all the time, like nobody in Australia cares about you. The embassy hasn't even reached out once to ask where you are. Um, they know you're guilty, therefore they haven't, they're not bothering about bringing you home. You know, you're a traitor to Australia too, as well as, you know, you, you know, like the Australians know you work for Israel, like, and you're an Australian citizen, so they wouldn't care about you. You know, they would say all sorts of bullshit to me. So when they said that about my husband, I was just like, yeah, whatever. Like, I didn't didn't believe it. And I actually laughed at them, I think, when they said it. I don't know whether they knew that or not. They could have just been saying that to upset me and, and actually it was true, but they didn't know, you know. So either they knew something or they didn't. I'm not sure. But I, at the time I didn't really believe them. Had you kind of made peace with yourself in your mind that whatever the reason your marriage was over while you were still in prison? I wasn't thinking about it a lot, to be honest. It, the, the outside world felt so far away. I was really, my coping mechanism was to just focus on the here and now, live in the moment and forget the future, forget the, like, you know, just not think about my old life, thinking about my family, my job, my everything, my relationship. It, it upset me a lot. So I would just sort of um, numb myself and just live in the here and now and try and focus on various, you know, goings on within the 2A unit, what my friends were up to, 
uh, you know, concerning myself with the day-to-day routine. So I, whilst I did think about it, I, I was pretty sure marriage was over just because I didn't feel that I was getting the support that I would have wanted from a partner in such a situation and that I thought I would have given had it been reversed. So I felt like, well, when I do come home, whenever that may be, um, I don't think we can come back from this. After 804 days on November the 25th, 2020, you were released. Could you believe it? No. Um, I also had such a, a mistrust that it was real, that even when it was happening, I, I had part of my brain was going, don't celebrate yet. Something could still happen to, to F it up, you know, like you've got out of prison, but you're still on Iranian territory. They can come and pick you up at any moment. Um, they can turn the plane around in the sky as long as you're still in Iranian airspace and take you straight back. So, you know, the diplomatic deal had fallen through a few times and I just... I didn't want to give myself false hope. So even when the ambassador came three days earlier and told me two days before my release and said to me, we're going to release you in 48 hours, uh, Nick Warner, the envoy, who's fantastic, he did so much to help, and, and the ambassador Lindell too, you know, he's on his way, he's in the air. I just didn't believe it. And I thought, okay, this is another time it's going to fall through. So only at the only when we passed out of Iranian airspace and landed in Qatar in Doha which was our first stop on the way back to Australia did I actually kind of start to breathe and try to grapple with the fact that I wasn't in Iran anymore they couldn't get me anymore that is not the end of my conversation with Kylie if you are a Mamma Mia subscriber you can hear what happened to Kylie after she got out And in this subscriber episode, she talks about how her life changed forever, what it was like trying to acclimatise, and what happened when she got back to her house and her marriage. And that part is just unbelievable. Them together in the street and published them, and that was quite upsetting for me to see. Um, But it is what it is, and, you know, I wish them all the best. Follow the link in the show notes to hear that episode. You can find Kylie's book, The Uncaged Sky, it's brilliant, via a link in our show notes. Our producer is Gia Moylan. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff and I'm Mia Friedman. 